Jesus glad and the devil mad. Amen. Let's rejoice. Let's together. Heavenly Father, I'm here to lift you up, magnify you, to magnify my Jesus. He's my everything. That means this word is everything. I'm ordering my life after the counsel of your word, and your Holy Spirit lives and abides with me forever to lead and guide me in all that is before me. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You can be seated. Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 5, and while you're turning, get Acts chapter 10 in front of you too. And we've got two verses here we're going to start with. Luke 5, 17, and uh, it's talking about Jesus. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Everybody say God's healing power. All right, and then Acts 10, 38, G, uh, Peter is preaching to Cornelius' house, and to Cornelius and his near kin and his friends. You know, he's Jewish. He's a, a centurion of the Italian band. He was a good man, and God was unwilling for him to just walk in Judaism. He sent an angel to tell him to make ready for Peter, and he sent Peter to preach to him the gospel. They all got saved. And, and in the middle of the preaching, in Acts 10, 38, uh, Peter told them how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Everybody shout, God's healing power. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to teach you today about God's healing power. Hallelujah. And so... In 2023, this is the year of God's power. And there's all kinds of power available. Authority and supernatural power, both are available this year. But I'm just thinking about God's healing power this morning. I want to sp talk specifically about it because the church is, listen, we already know the devil is just crazy mad. He's unleashing every sort of infirmity and sickness over the body of Christ. And honestly, we've been, listen, Jesus took it already. I was meditating on Matthew uh, 8, 16, and 17, how that uh, when the evening was come, it said that they brought unto Jesus uh, many that were possessed with demons, and he, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and he healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet himself, bear our sicknesses and took our infirmities. Jesus bore it. He took it 2,000 years ago. And uh, I was meditating on it recently. And of course, you know, I was, I was taught English. Did anybody ever get taught English in high school? You know, you got taught, you know, got talked about verbs, adverbs, subjects, predicates, and all that. So we used to divide sentences. Did y'all ever do div dividing your sentences? You know, they don't do that anymore, but I, it helped me to understand the language. And so uh, even though I use ain't and all of that sometimes. And so, you know, they, so those are action verbs. Those two, bear and take, they were action. And so God said, Jesus took action against sickness and disease 2,000 years ago. Then why should we have to take action? Well, if you've been coming around here very long, you know that redemption, Jesus redeemed us from sickness and disease. But redemption has two parts. It has two sides to it. It has the legal side, which Jesus has already done. Legally, we're healed. In the mind of God, in the sight of God, we are already healed. That's why we don't beg for healing. That's why we don't even ask for healing. Not in this church. We don't beg God to heal people because healing's already occurred. That's the legal side. But then there's the vital side. In vicia, in the Latin, according to life, I like to call it the functional side of redemption. And that means that that's 
the results of your faith and patience. When you, when you realize what the Word says, then you have something to do. You have to resist what the devil's trying to put on you. You've got a part to play in your healing, and that is to resist the devil with everything that's in you. And how can you resist something if you think that God sent it? How can you resist something if you have a doubt about whether you might deserve to be uh, sick? No, it's not about deserves. We deserve worse than that. We deserve hell, but we ain't going there. See, there's that word ain't again. It's just nothing. It sounds good when you say that. We ain't going there. Eat your heart out, devil. You're going to go there. First, you're going to the bottomless pit. Man, I know a thousand years in the bottomless pit. That's got to be, that's got to be the pits. <laughs> and then when we get him out, we'll let him loose for a little while, and then we'll throw him in the lake of fire. Man, I'm telling you, that's worse than hell. Lake of fire, lake of fire. Woo! So when he starts uh, trying to accuse you, just start rehearsing his future to him. All right, so, so God has delegated his power to the church and in the church. If the head of the church had healing power, then the body of Christ has healing power. The church, it, 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 sickness and disease, we're set against it in every way, shape, or form right here in, in the church. So here in Luke, though, we see that, that God's healing power was present to heal them. Who were them? Well, the Pharisees and the doctors of the law, the Sadducees, the wooden seas, the couldn't seas. They were all hanging out there, packed in that house, wasn't any room to get in there, standing room only. And uh, there was no record. You know that out of that group of people had to be somebody in there that needed healing. I mean, Israel's sick. Jesus spent a big part of his time healing the sick of Israel. He was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And they had a covenant with God that they had forgotten. They had not appropriated healing. They had forgotten about Jehovah Rapha. Right after the Red Sea parted in Exodus 15, I mean, God revealed himself to Israel. I am the Lord that healeth thee, Jehovah Rapha. Well, they forgot it. They're backslid like a lot of the church. A lot of the church doesn't hear this. A lot of the church go to the wrong kind of church. You know what? If you go to the kind of a church that doesn't believe in healing, you need to get out of that thing. Amen. If there's no healing in your church, then it's not scriptural. Amen. Well, there's more to it than just healing. Oh, really? We tell that to somebody that's fighting for their life. Amen. I'm telling you right now, it's, I'm, I'm not going to put up with the devil killing our people. We've, had, we've lost too many members of, of this church with, with sicknesses and diseases. I'm going to keep, I'm going to double down on healing. And get your faith built up. So not one record of any of them being healed, but then in the next verse that we didn't read, I'll just tell you what it says. There was a man with palsy. Palsy was a disease, a paralysis. It was terminal. There was no known cure for it. When you got palsy, you just, died. You, got, you just went down, down, down until you died. That was it. But there was a man with a palsy who had four crazy friends. I mean, they had crazy faith. Gladys, we call her sister crazy faith occasionally because she just comes up with things. And, and I go, ooh, you said that? You put a time limit on it? I mean, you know, I, don't, I preach not to do that, but she doesn't listen to me. I mean, when something gets her in her spirit, she speaks it forth, and it comes to pass. And so they had crazy faith to carry this man on a stretcher, and they get to this house where Jesus is teaching. They must have heard about a teach. He was there teaching. Because, see, Jesus went about teaching, preaching, and then healing. He didn't just heal people. He taught, and he preached. And let me tell you something. If you didn't listen to the teaching and the preaching, you didn't get to partake of the healing which is what happened to all these doctors of the law and Pharisees. They heard the teaching, but they were too busy trying to find fault with him. How do you know that? Well, I'm fixed to tell you. So he, he, uh, this, this man with the four crazy friends, they get to the house. They can't get in. Said, I got a good idea. Let's get him up on the roof. Let's break a hole in the roof. We'll lower him down into the presence of Jesus. Now, you know, that took some crazy faith to do that. 
And the man on the stretcher thought, well, I guess I don't have much to lose. I'm going to die anyway. I might as well die of a broken neck if they drop me. <laughs> Maybe it'll end my suffering. No, he didn't say that. And they broke a hole in the roof. Jesus is teaching these deadheads. They're not listening to him. And all of a sudden sawdust and, and sheetrock pieces and everything, two before, start falling out of the ceiling. And Jesus looks up and here they're lowering this man down. And the Bible says, and when Jesus saw their faith, their faith. Now listen to me, their faith. One of the keys of God's healing power is more than just individuals that are fighting for their life having faith, but her, their crazy friends need to have some faith. We're going to have to get around some of our folks that are fighting a little bit more faithfully than maybe we've done in the past. Now, they still have to trust God. They have to exhibit faith on their side, but we've got a role to play as their crazy friends. I, I just, I see this whole testimony as a picture of how the church should operate. I mean, you know, at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 said we ought, to, we ought to exhibit the same care one for another. If one member suffers, we all suffer. If one member is honored, we all rejoice. It ought to be something like that in church. And if you're not in a church like that, get out. Don't go to some old backbiting, gossip-filled bunch of baloney deadheads that when you are in need, they start trying to figure out why. What did you do? Well, brother, the curse calls us does not come. Well, yeah, you're the curse. God, it's amazing. Why are they like that? Because they don't hear any different. You know, one of the names of this church is God's Houston's uh, Healing Center. Well, that sounds pretentious. Well, I don't, I don't know. There might be lots of Houston Healing Centers, but this is one of them. People get healed in this church. I mean, we, we have had the most outstanding miracles. We had a little girl that was born with a heart defect. She had a hole in her heart. And the doctor said, well, we've done all we can do, but when she gets a little older, we're going to have to have a surgery. It's going to be risky. And so she got 10 years old, and it was time for that surgery. It was very risky. She had a I saw the pile of medical records. Uh, it was that thick that said she had to have surgery. Gladys and I laid hands on her, and she, she didn't have to have the surgery. She's perfectly well, perfectly whole. God healed her. The doctor was totally amazed. He was prepared for like a 15 or 16 hour surgery. He said, I'm going to send the nurse out to talk to the grandmother and the mother. Grandmother came to this church at that time. And, and, and you know, they, we're, we're going to come out about every 45 minutes to an hour and give you an update because it's going to be a long surgery and y'all just get ready. And they just, you know, they just were so disappointed that she had, after laying hands on her, that she had to go ahead and have the surgery. I said, well, don't worry about that part. She's healed. And so in about 30 minutes, here comes the nurse, or here comes the doctor. The, doc, the surgeon comes out. And I thought, oh, no. See, they thought she died. He said, well, I don't know how to explain this, but something told me to run one more test before we opened her up. And I did a transesophageal electrocardiogram. I ran that thing down her throat to see a better picture of that hole that we saw just last week. And, uh, and so he said, it's not there. It's healed up. She's completely... Oh, come on, lift your hands right now. That's just one example in 30 years. That's just one example. I'm telling you, there's healing in the house. God's healing power is here. And not because of me or Gladys. It's because of all of us. It's the church of Jesus Christ, the way it ought to operate. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, son, thy sins be forgiven. <laughs> He didn't come for forgiveness, but that's what Jesus did. Son, thy sins be forgiven. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to tweak the unbelievers in there. He knew that would just... See, a lot of what Jesus did was tweak the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the wooden seas, and the couldn't seas. He'd say things and do things to just make them, just offend them, make them, their nose go out of joint. And they start, <laughs> who does he think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Oh, you doubt that I can forgive. So that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I'm going to say unto him, rise, take up your bed, and go back home. And the man 
Now, he'd been paralyzed. He was carried there. We don't know how long he'd been in that condition, but probably a pretty good while. I mean, I, you know, after you don't walk and you don't move or anything, you can hardly move. I mean, you know, and for him to get up, it took faith for him to get up. He could have done like what one, one person did at, at, in a healing line with Brother Hagin. He told this woman, this woman, get up. Okay, now get up. Well, can't you see I'm in this wheelchair? I can't get up. See, everybody else in the line had gotten up out of a wheelchair. There are five wheelchair patients. Four of them had gotten up and ran. And she said to him, I can't get up. What, was happened, to, what happened to her? She didn't mix any faith with what she heard. She had no faith. It's going to take faith to receive God's healing power. Faith is a switch that turns on God's power. I mean, no faith, no switch turned on. I mean, if you don't turn the light switch on, it's going to be dark in here. I came in here one time. I didn't turn the light switch on. I thought, oh, there's plenty of light coming in those doors. It's middle of the day. And I came up to this altar, and I fell right over the front steps. I just didn't even see it, man. I'm, I'm so glad I didn't knock all my teeth out. And I thought, what am I doing? I, it's so dark up here. It's just a it's just a few feet from here to that door. You'd think there'd be enough. Hey, no light. What did I do? I didn't turn on the switch. A lot of people don't know why. Why am I going through? Well, let's, let's find out our faith. Let's make sure we got the switch of faith turned on and keep it turned on. All right. So uh, every joint supplies, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4. Every joint. See, every member of the church is important. That's why we all have to rally around each other when we're going through battles. That's why it's valuable to have a, a Bible-believing, spirit-filled church in the first place. You're not islands under yourself. You're not all disconnected. You are plugged in. And, uh, you know, we, we've, got to get, we've got to get behind the people that are going through things. You know, God told it to me like this a few years ago. Love plus unity equal miracles. When we love each other enough to keep up with each other and stand with each other when we're going through things. And I don't say we sit around and beg for so-and-so to be healed. No, that's a finished fact. What we do is praise God that they're healed and then pray in the Holy Ghost. Because all, anybody that's ever gone through any kind of, of disease that is threatening their life, they have, a, they have a, a pathway they have to walk. They have to hear from God about the treatment because you can go to the doctor and he can kill you. A lot of this treatment that they're doing for cancer has got such negative side effects that if you don't hear from God correctly, you could just go ahead and sign your own death warrant. So it's important the church rally around each one of these and pray for them in the Holy Ghost so that they can, it, well, you know, it just lifts their arms up. Aaron, you know, Aaron and her lifted up the, Moses' arms. And as long as Moses' arms were lifted up, the enemy was defeated. Joshua was cleaning the enemy's clock down there in the valley. Are y'all getting this now? This corporate faith that has to operate more consistently. So let me give you three uh, facts about God's healing power. I know that you've heard this, but we need to hear it over and over again. Um, so I've already mentioned the first one. God's healing power flows when you turn on the switch of faith. You turn on the switch of faith. Um, you know, when you get a bad report, you've got to look at what the Word says about healing and get, get us, get a, get a rhema word, get a scripture. Don't, don't start, don't start going off half cock. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean, don't just get panicky and start praying everything under the sun. You say, now God, this is, this report uh, is an evil report. I choose to re believe the report of the Lord. I'm going to get into my Bible and I know that you've got a rhema word. You've got a special rhema word for me. And, uh, brother, brother Hagen was asked to go to pray for or visit an 82 year old evangelist woman, Pentecostal woman. And she had had such an effective ministry for years. And the pastor said, look, I'm in the ministry today because of her. She got me saved and she encouraged me in my ministry. It wasn't for, wasn't for her. I wouldn't even be here. And I know several ministers like that. She is a 
fine woman, but she had gotten cancer and was in the final stages. So I just want you to go by and, and talk to her. Brother Hagen went and, and, and he said, you know, her stomach, she looked pregnant because she had tumors on her abdomen. And it was way up where she's laying down. She couldn't see her feet. And she had wasted away everywhere else. Her skin was thin. And she looked the picture of death. And he said, uh, Sister, I don't know, uh, but I just feel led to give you Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 22. My, my son, my daughter, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, but keep them in the midst of thine heart. For my word is life unto those that find them. And medicine or health, medicine to all their flesh. Say, so we're taking, it's not wrong to take earthly medicine, but you better take the medicine of the word. You need a word. You need to find a word that you can stand on. And don't get in a panic and start like a shotgun, start shooting, you know, all over the universe. Look, get, get something that's direct and do warfare with that. And so you, uh, you know, he, she said, he, and he told her his testimony about how he came off the bed of sickness. He saw himself well. He saw himself well. He, 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 and, and, you know, one day he just was able to get out of the bed and stand, up and, and he was dizzy, and he almost fainted, so he had to get back in bed, and he stayed there another hour or two, but finally he got up out of bed. He walked across the room. He got dressed. He went downstairs and ate for the first time in 16 or 18 months just like the man with the paralyzed man that got up. He took his bed. I hope it wasn't a sleep number. <laughs> took his bed and walked all the way home. I love the picture of that. I love just thinking about him going right through the, all those unbelieving, you know, high muckety-muck Jews. You know, here they are. They've got their doctor of divinity degree. They've got their education They've got their diplomas on the wall. He just walked right through the middle of them carrying him his bed and went out the front door that he couldn't get in, but, you know, just a little while before that. And he walks all the way. Oh, glory to God. So you see, first of all, you just need, you know, you need to say something about your cir circumstance. You need to say, thank God I'm healed. By his stripes I'm healed. Thank God I'm healed. Let, let God's word become medicine to your flesh and start saying that. Develop when you say, the word say there, I'm reminded of the woman with the issue of blood who came in the press behind and touched the hem of his garment. For when she had heard of Jesus, she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. That word said is the Greek word lego, which means have a systematic discourse. In other words, you don't say something once, you say it over and over again. That's why you need to find the word that you need and say it over and over. You start seeing yourself well. And getting back to that 82-year-old evangelist, three months later in Fort Worth, Texas, Brother o brother. Uh, Hagen was in a meeting in the lobby, straightening up his book table, getting ready for the service. And these two women walk in and this, th they walked right over to brother Hagen. This woman threw her arms around brother Hagen and gave him a big hug. And he backed up and she said, well, you don't remember me, do you? No, I don't. So I'm the woman that you came and visited three months ago. And so then he wrapped his arms around her and they started dancing and having a Holy Ghost hold down there in the lobby. She said, Brother Hagen, I'm so glad you didn't let me die of cancer. You came to me and gave me the word, and I got to thinking about it, and I started seeing that my stomach flat. And I would look at my stomach. I couldn't see my feet, and I kept seeing it flat. I kept seeing it flat. I kept saying, you know, I'm healed. Thank God I'm healed. I took the word of God, and I said it over and over. And after a few weeks, my stomach started just shrunk down. And she said, I started making plans. I started getting the calendar out, and I found out where I was going to places that I hadn't been in a few years, and I put, a, I put them down on my calendar. I made plans to go here, plans to go there, and here I am. Oh, hallelujah. You got to see yourself well. See, you've got to see yourself well, which brings me to number two. You're a, you're a, you've got to see that you're a well person resisting sickness and disease. You can't see yourself as a sick person. If you consider yourself a sick person trying to get healed, you, you're in bad shape. 
You've got to, listen, the Bible says you're healed. I know what the doctor said. I know what the tests say. I know what the, the diagnostic, the PET scan, this, the, all of that. They've got sophisticated. And every one of those tests is the natural. Every one of those is things common to man. But the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God. Amen. They're supernatural weapons. The Word of God is supernatural. The Holy Ghost is supernatural. We don't have to accept the report of the doctor is final word. I'm not saying the doctor lied. He's giving you the best information that he has. So he's not lying. He's doing the best he can. Now you know what you've got to come against. I said, now you know what you've got to come against. So you're, you see yourself. You see yourself well. You say you're well. And then number three, because you see yourself well, because you say you're well, then act like you're well. These are the, this is the key to, to God's mighty power, God's healing power coming upon you. A lot of people do, do a little of this on an inconsistent basis, and they don't have results. Well, I just thought God knew my, you know, God knows and he cares. Well, that's good, but that doesn't mean you're going to get healed. God does know, he does care, and he made provision for you, and it's up to you to get it. It's up to you to receive it, I should say. Not get it. It's been gotten for you. You just have to receive it. Amen. Amen. That's why we pray uh, and lay hands on people here at the altar. It gives people a jumping off point Amen. where they can say, you know, I got prayed for July 16th, Sunday morning service. Hands were laid on me, and I believe I received my healing right Amen. then. Amen. See, you've got to have a definite, you've got to have a definite point of demarcation from that sickness to health. And so the laying on of hands, yes, the anointing comes into you. You might not feel a thing. See, it's not about goosebumps. It's not about even whether you fell out. Some people fall out because they want to. Some people fall out because they, they can't stand up anymore. But in my experience, most people fall because they're yielding. They, want, they just want to yield to God's power. And both are right. Both are fine. That's why we have catchers. I was in Mexico years ago, and we were praying for people in an old sheep shearing shed out in the mi middle of the mountains outside of Saltillo, Mexico. They had apple orchards, you know, they'd, they'd shake the apple trees, the apples would fall, and they'd just run down this valley. They'd just gravity fed. <laughs> and all the apples would roll down about a thousand feet down, down this mountainside. <laughs> and, uh, the meeting announcement was by the pastor. He looked like a, 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 the guy that played in the good, the bad, and the ugly. The guy that played the ugly and the good, the bad, the ugly. That's what he looked like. I mean, he was a rough, and he had a real rough voice. Well, I found out why, because he announces the meetings on the side of the road. Hi, you know, <laughs> he'd holler, and his voice would echo through those, through those mountains. And I mean, that night, we had like 50, 75 people came from all around. And they were in this open-air sheep shearing shed. It had a metal roof, a concrete floor, and some benches. And uh, we had a, a brother that was preaching. We had him, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, he was interpreting. And uh, he interpreted the message. And we had an altar call, and people came up for prayer. And, uh, you know, there wasn't any catchers. We didn't have any ushers. And so we laid hands on people, and they fell, you know. They fell. They didn't, nobody taught them how to fall. I mean, they just fell because the power of God was in manifestation. And one lady was nursing her baby. She's got a nursing infant. And a friend of mine is next to me, and he laid hands on her, and she fell out. Boom. Hit the concrete. Sounded like a watermelon hit the concrete. Bam. That baby never missed a thing. She just, that baby just kept on feeding on mom. Mom didn't, I mean, you know, and a little while later, I, th I thought, man, she's going to ever, ever get up. And she got up. I mean, everything was just fine. Oh, I'm telling you the power of God. God's healing power came into that place. Glory. Come on, lift your hands right now. Got to act on what you have seen and, and what you're saying. You've got to act like, faith is acting like the Bible is true. I said faith is acting like the Bible is true. You can't separate faith from receiving God's healing power. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It says, it looks like you've fallen. Well, no, I haven't fallen. 
Leave me alone. I'm gonna... Does anybody want to buy an Apple Watch? Sell it cheap. It's always bugging me, rattling my wrist, looking at it. When they're singing, it's just too loud in there. You better turn the, the, it's just way too loud. Not loud enough for me. I like it really loud. All right. So act like you're healed. Faith is acting like the Bible is true. I mean, lame man did what Jesus told him. He got up and walked with his bed on his back. He walked all the way home. <laughs> oh, come on, lift your hands. Father, we thank you for God's healing power. It's been in manifestation. Hallelujah. We're going to see more miracles. We're going to see more people receive their healing. <laughs> 